Hello. Hello. Wow. And He's welcome back to the chat. Uh, yeah. Um, so <laughs> to the channel. Welcome back. Oh yeah, thanks, Dylan. Um, this is uh Dylan. <laughs> you you can do what that again if you want. <laughs> what is food stuff? No, let's do it. Let's do it. Um, so this is another episode of Anatomy of a Classic, the series where I, joined by a guest, break down a classic album piece by piece. Uh, influence, personnel, you know, choice of single, choice of sequencing, choice of production, how we think it holds up, and what we think it influenced down the line. Um, all those things and more coming in the next probably over an hour of talking, knowing uh, this man who is joining me today. Um, Dylan is very passionate music lover, drummer for the Minx. Um, other stuff, I guess. You, you, you like Bob Dylan? <laughs> I don't know. What else is there about you? Yeah, it's it's always interesting seeing uh, how quickly your entire uh, sense of worth and being can get tied to another artist. Like when Tom Petty died, I think I had 17 people text me, like asking me <laughs> if I was okay, which was very kind. Um, but it's like, man, you know, this wasn't my uncle or anything like that, but uh, no, I am uncle. uncle. Exactly. Um, but no, I, yes, yeah, like you said, I'm the drummer for a band called The Minx, M-I-N-K-S. I'm a musician that lives here in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, I've had the distinct pleasure of playing with Ron Gallo, Aaron Lee Tasjan, and a few other people here in town. Um, and I spend way too much time during the day on the Taste Like Music Discord with you and so many of our fellow fellow friends. Exactly. That's how I get 95% of my guests on, uh, <laughs> is through all those meaningless chats. So today, um, I knew I wanted to get Dylan on the channel. We've been planning this for six, seven weeks was when we planned the day. It was ages ago. You're like, August. I was like, okay, sure. Like, <laughs> um, I'm a busy boy. You are indeed. And um, I was kind of thinking, like, we can't really do dylan because i'm kind of doing an entire series reviewing dylan's albums um i already did tom petty so i wouldn't rule out doing a tom petty album in the future but i kind of want to do a lot of artists where i'm not planning on doing the entire discography anytime soon and then i was like going through your rated music highest rated uh albums and i was like excitable boy and it made me an excitable boy because uh what a great album it is and that is the album we're discussing today what is your history with first Warren Zevon, secondly, this album? Yeah, uh, like a lot of artists, I discovered Warren Zevon through my dad, who's a fan. Um, I'm sure I'd heard Werewolves of London on the radio before without really knowing who it was, but I was probably nine or ten years old when I was properly introduced to him. And Excitable Boy was one of the albums my dad had, and... You know, I liked it from the beginning and I recognized that there were humorous elements to it at the time when I was younger, but I really fell in love with it and kind of fully grasped the nature of the album and the brilliance of his songwriting in my early 20s. Um, I was in a band with some guys back home who loved Zevon, so we ate him up all the time when we were traveling and it kind of became one of those situations where even though I had heard all these songs many times before, I was really listening to them for the first time, if you know what I mean. Um, so that's when this album really began rising up in rank for me and when Warren in general began rising up the ranks as an artist for me. Um, and that all culminated uh, when our lead singer of, of that band I was in, he turned 30 and we had a big birthday bash for him where we did an entire set of Zevon covers, uh, including five of the nine tracks from this album. Um, to date, still one of my favorite shows I've ever played. Um, so yeah, th this album has been in my life to some degree for a long time, but it's it's continued marinating over the years to the point where it's one of my all-time favorites. And I, I think uh, when I was a guest on... Um, Tastes Like Music, I think back in 2021 when they were doing their recommendation series, I was asked to give uh, 
five albums uh, for them to keep in mind um, when trying to sort of figure out my tastes and, and Excitable Boy was one of the ones I named. So that's that's how highly I think of it. That's, yeah, I did I didn't even remember that. I did watch that video, but that's cool. Mm. Um, well, <laughs> let everyone watching know that you don't really support the channel. That's no. good. Yeah, only my hard-earned money. Yeah, nothing else, really. Um, so <clears throat> my my history with the album, definitely not as storied as yours, and definitely not as storied as a lot of other albums in this series. Like, I usually have a big spiel to go on, but this, I think, other than Quadrophenia, is the most recent discovery out of all of these for me. Um, I actually first heard this in a listening party in the Taste Like Music Discord. I can't remember what the yes. occasion was. It I it might have just been like random albums. And uh, I only knew Zevon for Werewolves of London, um, which I've talked about this phenomenon a lot on the channel. The idea of like songs that exist and you don't have an opinion on. Like before I really got into music, I knew what Werewolves of London was. I didn't like it or dislike it. I you know, I was like, sure, it's the song from American Werewolf in London. Like, it's uh, it's it's there. Um, but I think as soon as I heard the album once, I was really in love with the sort of the sound and the production of it. Whereas the repeat listens really sort of rewarded, were really rewarding and showed off Zevon's talent as a songwriter, which is, you know, especially going through his entire discography. Uh, his production wasn't always that great. Um, <laughs> but one thing you could always rely on in his albums was pretty solid songwriting, even to, you know, towards the eight, through the eighties and nineties. And then of course mm -hmm. his, his latest albums were all pretty great. So um, yeah, not as exciting a story as some other albums, but I'm keeping it real. You know, they can't all be like, I don't know. I came around to my friend's house and hunky dory was playing and it was the most magical. No, it was just, I was just sat at home in a listening party and I enjoyed it. I mean, you know, for all of your negative qualities, at least you have honesty on the positive side of things. And and that's one of the reasons we continue to put up with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We as in everybody on planet Earth. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, the next section that I usually go to is sort of like the conception of the album and namely the personnel, which when you're talking mm -hmm. about a Warren Zevon album is like one of the big, the big things that comes to mind. I think it's Transverse City, which the first song has a guitar solo from Jerry Garcia, and the second yeah. song has a guitar solo from David Gilmour. It's like, <laughs> what? How? Um, but like, the re the reason is that everybody loved and respected him and wanted him to make the best quality music that he could. And I think that says a lot. Um, yeah. I could go on all day talking about the people on this, but I've just highlighted a few. Jackson Brown, of course, co-producers sings harmony vocals, plays guitar on a lot of the tracks. Um, mm -hmm. Wales of London has the Fleetwood Mac rhythm section. <laughs> like, come on, that's crazy. Um, shout out Tavi, because Jeff Picaro plays drums on Nighttime in the Switching Yard. And Linda Ronstadt sings backing vocals on the title track. It's loaded. It's absolutely loaded. Um, and it's like, compare this to like his self-titled or Transverse City or, uh, you know, his later sort of early 2000s stuff when he was really ill and you know people like Bruce Springsteen were helping him out even like compared to those it's like oh well there aren't that many <laughs> big names there but the names that are there are like huge you know yeah and, and then even past that you know people people like Leland Sklar and and Jim Horn Rick Murata Bob Glaub you know might not be household names but if you're a music lover and a music listener and you've spent time, you know, studying, especially this period of history, you know that those are, you know, the he the heaviest of the heavy hitters. I mean, Jim Horn is the horn player uh, and, and he's the one laying down the sax on Excitable Boy. And I mean, Leland Sklar and Bob Glaub, uh, un unbelievable bass players, Rick Murata, same thing. I mean, and then... Um, yeah, I mean, just just to have John McVie and Mick Fleetwood casually roll <laughs> into play on Werewolves of London, and after having I mean, Lindsey Buckingham and Stevie Nicks on the previous album, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, unreal, <laughs> unreal. Uh, he had an insane pull, um, and I think it's easy to see why. You know, from his his talent as a songwriter, his sort of personality, and also I think his generosity as a performer, like 
the the songs are all about Warren and his lyrics, but there's almost always like a cool little instrumental part, and there's always enough time to, you know, fill out these songs. Um, well, yeah, Warren was a a brilliant musician. I uh, I believe he was, and I'm gonna look this up to make sure that I'm not messing this up, but I believe he was the band leader for the Everly Brothers um, in the uh, in the late '60s. I could be wrong about that or, or early seventies. Yeah. Okay. He, he was their band leader. Um, so he was extremely trained and, and you can tell that there's certain sections, even on this album where, you know, you don't, you don't write these sorts of chords or these sorts of songs. If you're not heavily, heavily uh, trained and, and that's the thing. There, there's so much to love about Zivon. You know, his piano playing is very distinctive. He's got a great melodic grasp. I think he's, a great singer with a lot of character. I, th I think he simultaneously sounds very familiar, um, but also not really like anyone else that I can think of. Um, and I think all of that, like you said, kind of lends to him, um, you know, having this this wider reach, you know, musicians want to play with him and, and people want to be around him. Um, but yeah, I mean, songwriting is obviously the big draw. Um, I think he's very similar to John Prine in the way that he can make you laugh your ass off and cry your heart, your heart out within the span of, of one song. Um, and also like Prine, he kind of effortlessly navigates between topical and political subjects and also really deep personal emotionalism. Uh, I, th I think the main difference is that, you know, Prine's a lot more steeped in traditional Americana, whereas Zivon, Zivon tends to skew a little bit more like, i don't know if you want to call it pop music sensibilities but but there's a distinct difference i think um but he's yeah. so funny he's so intelligent and yeah on this album in particular everything i just mentioned i think he's firing on all cylinders yeah there's it's really hard to define the sound of the album and the style of it because it is like when i think of what kind of music is excitable boy i think 70s <laughs> that's like what comes into my head but then it's like it it's it's because it's 1978 you have like these sort of piano pop rock kind of vibes that you would have had a lot of in the first half of the decade there's a bit of pub rock in there i think um the mm. idea slightly and then also obviously you got nighttime in the switching yard which uh kind of dabbles in sort of i guess funk slash disco slash whatever you want to call it um so yeah, it's kind of like this kaleidoscopic uh, picture of seventies music in a lot of ways. You have like the the sort of more Americana style ballads, but still very much piano led. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that's yeah, that's a cool thing about it. Whilst never feeling sort of all over the place or like it's so purposeful, and the production is a big part of that in making it sound sort of very coherent from song to song. Like you, you hear a song from this album, and I don't think you could mistake it from a song from any other Zevon album. No, you know, it, it, and it's not even like it's drastically different from the album that came before the nineteen seventy six self titled. But yeah, it's um, it's definitely got that kind of close mic, warm, dry. You know, not not like Rick Rubin, warm and dry, but you know, the 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 drums are are very present the bass is very present um but yeah it, it feels like everything's very condensed in, in a really really nice way it's not too heavily drenched in reverb it's not shouting at you too much yeah it, it is kind of difficult to describe but i feel the exact same way as you it's like yep this is the 70s you know specifically you know kind of late late 70s um and yeah it doesn't have a like those big sort of like sweeping string arrangements anywhere that are are on the album before this um it's it feels this very like it's almost as if as performed live is kind of like what i would say yeah well like the it's very compact yeah yeah um for sure so it's uh it's it's an interesting album to think about in that sense, but we've got to we've got to carry on and get through these categories because there are songs on this album as well as sounds on it. Um, and the lead single, of course, is Werewolves of London. 
Um, come on, just an absolute classic. It's that piano part. As soon as it starts, it just grabs me. It's so catchy as an instrumental part, you know. Um, the the rhythm guitar is so cool, so funky. Um, obviously, John McVie and Mick Fleetwood. Uh, you can't really ask for a better sort of rhythm section in terms of solid as a rock chemistry for this time. This is a year after Rumors came out. Um, I is a perfect song, I think, but I do slightly prefer the version from Stand in the Fire with the shout outs mm. to James Taylor and Jackson Brown and yeah, so funny, but this version is also great. Yeah, just it's such a ridiculous song, but it, it it's one of those songs where you know people hear it and they think it's you know um, almost like a novelty song and and maybe to some degree it is and it, and it's got that big jokey sing along chorus, you know, the uh, as everyone knows. But I mean, just read it, reading the lyrics, I mean, so few people like just this almost almost dylan-esque sort of surreal observational uh approach you know uh he's the hairy-headed gent who ran amok in kent lately he's been overheard in mayfair you better stay from him he'll rip your lungs out jim i like to meet his tailor i mean it, like that's such an insane line to write and that's what makes it so brilliant like very few people could write this song and i'm so yeah. glad that he did i think i think another part of that is something i've definitely found is like when a set of lyrics becomes so famous you you can't really look at it at face value because you i don't know something subconsciously in my brain is like yeah those are the lyrics to wales of london they couldn't be anything different but like you actually sit down and read those like this is nuts <laughs> like <laughs> if this is the first time i was hearing this song and i'd never heard it before and i was just like reading along the lyrics i'd be like what <laughs> Yeah, I uh, the the one that always gets me is the last line. Just I saw a werewolf drinking a pina colada at Trader Vic's. His hair was perfect. What? <laughs> it's so, it's so funny. But it's, I, I feel weird calling it intelligent, but it feels intelligent to me because it means absolutely nothing. But I feel like, again, no one else could write that. No one else would think to write it. No one else would create this insane world where, you know, he's he's talking about something so ridiculous as if it's just something that happens on a regular basis. And there's yeah, nothing wrong with that. That's the thing. It's, it's, I was just going to say it's all about the delivery and the conviction. And yeah. you mentioned him being a great singer. And for people who've never heard Warren Zevon sing before, uh, he's not a traditionally great singer by, no. you know, what most people would say. But like you said, that personality, that character, the conviction in his voice and the attitude and the sort of, yeah, like when he's telling you a story, you believe every word, no matter how absurd it is, um, which is kind of different to Dylan, right? Where sometimes he's telling you a story and you're like, is this like is this just bullshit or <laughs> like <laughs> whereas with Zevon it's like I'm never in doubt it's like this is definitely true while I'm listening to the song yeah, yeah. Um, absolutely so Wales London is, is is brilliant but let it not um detract from the rest of the album because uh I don't think it's the best song on the album um I don't think the opening track is the best song on the album either, but that's the next the next in the order of business. Um, Johnny Strikes Up the Band. Um, I think this is an interesting one because I think the first time I heard the album, this was one of the most instant songs for me. Like This is one of the ones where I'm like, yeah, I love this straight away. Whereas maybe it was my second or third favorite song on the album. And now it's slipped a little bit just because other songs have grown on me over time. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's one of his most accessible songs like it's so melodic um, I absolutely love the bridge the journey is my main man oh my god it's so good um, and you can tell that for, just from this song that the musicianship is going to be top notch throughout the album it is so tight so tight and it is you know we talk about what makes a good lead single what makes a good opening track I, I don't think you could have picked better really on either account yeah i i don't think that there's any other song that could have opened this album it, it kind of reminds me of the song sergeant pepper's lonely hearts club band and the way that it, it kind of announces 
the album like hey yeah we're striking up the band we're going and um and you're and i completely agree that the band on this and and to your point like that you made earlier just him giving the musicians this this palette to work with and this palette to really showcase themselves the guitar work on this song um i i, I don't know if if it's danny korchmar or, or who it is in general that's playing but they are absolutely crushing it. Warren's descending piano figures in the chorus. The da -da 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 it's so catchy, so good. The harmonies in that bridge on the Johnny is my main man. Fantastic. I, I think that this song just drives forward so nicely. It sets the tone for the album so perfect. Uh this, yeah, it's it's not my favorite, but it's it's one of them I, I i do adore this song when when we did the zivon show with my old band uh we opened up the three singers in the band did a an acapella version he has a song called i need a truck um which is on the deluxe version of this album it's like a quick like 30 or 40 second song they opened doing that acapella and then we launched right into johnny strikes up the band and it was so celebratory and, and perfect so i've really fond memories of this song in general yeah that's awesome that's awesome um next up is the favorite deep cut um i have a sneaking suspicion we have the same one here but my pick is accidentally like a martyr yeah yeah i thought so um it's this lovely ballad this is the one where i was thinking of the sort of Americana folky influence, but more in the songwriting than anything else. The arrangement still feels very much in line with the album, and mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's just the perfect way to end side one. I I think this might be his best ever vocal performance. Like it is so good, and I love the line. Never thought I'd have to pay so dearly for what was already mine. Just so good. Chorus is so memorable for a song so sad. Like it's really catchy. Um, I think he'd become more known for the really melancholic songs in his later career, obviously because of, you know, songs like Life Will Kill You and, you know, Keep Me In Your Heart. Keep Me In Your Heart. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but I think this is an early example of of that kind of song. And I think this is just as heartbreaking as any of them uh, in a lot of ways. Yeah, it's it's difficult for me to pick a favorite on this album, but this this one was my choice or favorite deep cut and it's it's way way up there you're right incredible vocal um i've used this phrase before but he taps into this devastating emotionalism uh both lyrically and vocally like you said you completely believe him and what a phrase accidentally like a martyr you know i wasn't trying to make any grave sacrifice here in loving you in in giving you everything the hurt gets worse and the heart gets harder, you know, and, and, and the rest of the lyrics, you know, are, are very simplistic, but they're perfectly effective. They're everything they're supposed to be. I mean, as far as breakup songs go, it, it's tough to write ones uh, greater than this one. And, and I love those instrumental interludes, you know, if, if I can geek out on the music theory for a second, he, he goes into these interludes where, um he he it goes into seven four or it's at least a phrase of seven you know which is very uncommon and then he modulates up from f major i think to a flat major which is another like it's super uncommon and your ear you know kind of catches it but it doesn't feel out of place it doesn't sound bad by means it sounds incredible and it effortlessly slides right back into the original key when the vocal comes back in uh musically an absolute triumph more excellent guitar work on this i love the sort of uh uh the guitar that comes in and out towards the end of that and I, I assume they're just using a volume pedal on it um yeah it's uh an absolutely perfect heartbreaking song and uh i don't know what else to say about it i i adore it it's a good point about the guitar at the end because i think again more so than any of his other albums maybe the self-titled as well but the arrangements here are so dense 
Like there are so mm-hmm. many little details that you can pick up on in how these songs are arranged and produced, which is always good. It's a treat for re-listeners, you know. Um, it's dense, but it's it's not overproduced either. You exactly. know, it, it's not it's not like oh, we're just throwing the kitchen sink at it and. You know, you know, I always think of Dewey Cox and Walk Hard, you know, I need more didgeridoos, 50,000 didgeridoos. You know, it's never like that. It's everything is always where it's supposed to be. Um, it's not hitting you. You know, when the background vocals need to come in, they come in and they disappear again. Uh, you know, like on this one, you know, the hurt gets worse, the heart gets harder. Leading into the the very last section, just those ah, in the back and then they disappear again. Like, so... So choice, a chef's kiss. It, indeed, yeah, indeed. Um, but no, it's, it's it's interesting you should mention that. Like, I feel like my, I, this sounds like a really obvious and stupid thing to say, but my ideal production is that sort of, you sort of write the songs and you sort of strip everything back and then you start laying things on one by one and figure out, okay, what needs to be here and what doesn't, which again, sounds obvious, but I think of albums like Abbey Road and albums like In Rainbows, an album like this and Skylarking by XTC, all these albums where it feels like everything there, there was so much purpose behind every single note that was played and every single choice of instrument. So mm-hmm. I really appreciate I completely that. agree. And and that's nothing without good songwriting. And that's what Zevon brings. So closing track is of course (laughs) yeah indeed lawyers guns and money which it is creeping up there my favorite on the album i will reveal later but this is creeping up there it's it's like a really strong number two and it's probably my second favorite zevon song overall it's just unlucky that it's on the same album as as my favorite zevon song (laughs) i mean it really doesn't get any better in terms of opening lyrics then I went home with the waiter, waitress the way I always do. How was I to know she was with the Russians too? Like that is is so good. And, and and literally, it's it's what I talked about before. And and again, like it's it's not like they're the only ones to ever do it, but it like him him and Prime the way that they like bring up you know you you think about you know where the U S was at in, in 1978, um, sociopolitically and for him to keep making these references to it. And, and, you know, there's so many numerous songs where they come up in, in random ways, but, and here he is talking about it, you know, talking about U S Russia, Russia relations, but tying it into the emotional part of it as, as well. And, and to do it so funny, it, it, it is, Oh, it's perfect. You're you're right. Not many better opening lines uh, ever, I would say. Yeah, and I've I've always there is a real quality to a song where anytime it comes on, no matter where you are, you have to sing along. And mm-hmm. the bit in this song is when he's going, "I'm down on my luck." <laughs> it's like, yeah, <laughs> God, I'm like. I, it just gets me hyped every I'm getting shivers just thinking about it. Like, just the way he delivers it is, like, so... I don't know. It, there's so much to his delivery here. It's, like, really funny mm-hmm. the way he says it. And each time he sort of, like, slurs it more. But then it's also, like, yeah, you're right. There is, like, a truth to what he's singing. He's not just writing these characters because he thought it would be funny. He's, like, putting a bit of himself in there as well, which is kind of interesting. Um yeah, and even the way that he like ever so slightly exaggerates, Dad, get me out of it. Like, and and adding that in, you know, he he's talking about, you know, I'm I'm going home with the waitress, and like, man, she's fine now. I'm gambling in Havana, blah, 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 like, and and then it comes back to Dad, get me out, you know, uh, sort of playing on this idea of like, you know, everyone's putting up this front of this really tough person they've got together but at the end of the day you know we we all got this scared little child inside of us and um you know and just s- send lawyers guns and money i mean <laughs> what a phrase <laughs> what a phrase i mean, it, absolutely i i hate to keep overusing this word but it's brilliant i mean you 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 think about um you know, every every news story you ever see, every, you know, 
you know, r- rich person getting in trouble for trying to skirt the law. And, and that's what it boils down to. It comes down to them getting the best lawyers, you know, all the money. And, and yeah, we'll, we'll throw the guns in there too, you know, for a little danger and a little violence. But it's, it's this song amazes me in so many ways. Like it is so catchy and the arrangement is brilliant. Um, and Zevon's vocal is perfect. But above all else, it's how he paints such a vivid picture of a character in such minimal lyrics. There's like almost mm-hmm. no lyrics. Most of it is just lawyers, guns, and money. Dad, get me out of this. Yep. And it's like, how? <laughs> it's like, because when yeah. I, maybe after like a second or third listen, when I listen to the song, I get an image in my head of what this guy looks like what his life looks like what his face looks like as he's having these thoughts of like shit um and it's equally funny and depressing because i think we as listeners and you know maybe to an extent zevon is sort of hinting to that through his vocal delivery is that he's gonna be fine like because his dad will get him out of this because i imagine his dad is some like in my head some like high-ranking ceo or something you know And he well, can yeah. do whatever I mean, he it, wants, and his dad will get him out of this. Well, yeah, there, there's a huge sense of entitlement and privilege. You know, uh, yeah, I, I'm an innocent bystander. You know, s- somehow I got stuck between a rock and a hard place. Like, I don't know how this, you know, dad, help me. Like, I, you know, there's no way. Yeah, you know, I'm just a guy that goes home with waitresses and gambles in Havana and hides out in Honduras, uh, you know. And that's, like you said, all the information you get, and it's, all the information you need, you know, I, I'm as, as you know, I'm as big a fan as any as, as Dylan's big sprawling epics where he gives you everything, but it takes just as much talent to be able to say that much, you know, with, with only this much. Yeah. And Zivon was so good at that throughout his career, especially on this album, I think, but you know, you look, you listen to keep me in your heart and you read the lyrics like, how did he write that in the condition he was in like is is almost beyond belief but um yeah and what i also love about it too is is it does that trick i think about a song like you wreck me by petty or what i like about you by the romantics where the guitar the guitar part the guitar chords are like the riff and the hook in and of themselves you know, you don't need to come up with an extra melody over it. Just those like, yeah, that's the hook right there. Just the chords that he writes. And same same thing with Johnny strikes up the band. Like I've never, ever listened to either one of those songs without going like this the whole time. Like it, it just friggin gets you going and perform so well, like, you know, in the, the way that the pianos and the guitars really coexist with each other, you know, Warren played both. I think on this piano, he's, or sorry, on this record, he's mostly on piano. And, and yeah, there's certain songs um, that are very clearly piano driven songs, but you don't think of it, at least I don't like an Elton John or a Billy Joel record. You know, it, to me, this is just a, whatever, a, a rock singer songwriter record. And, the guitars and the pianos, along with all the other instruments, they all have their place. And on a song like this, they just sit aside each other so well and react to each other so well. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so that leads us to the impact on music history section, where uh, usually I say where it landed on the Rolling Stones top 500 list, but it didn't land. Um and you know, you and I, you more so than me, but I, I would also say Dylan is a top, you know, whatever, 15. You're convinced he's going to be top 10 at some point, maybe. Um, artist of all time. I love Dylan. You love Dylan. Are the Basement Tapes and John Wesley Harding more essential albums than Excitable Boy? Really? Like, are they more deserving of a spot on that list? I'd. Dylan has well, eight albums and Zevon doesn't have one. I'm not saying Zevon deserves eight. I'm just like, well, any anyone who's ever um, been stuck talking to me about Dylan for more than five minutes um, has heard me profess my love for uh, Love and Theft, his 2001 record, which is at the moment, I have it number five out of his 40 albums. But I know that's on the top 500 and it would certainly be in my top 500. But if we're talking about 
you know, impact on American music history. I would take that off. The Basement Tapes and John Wesley Harding, you have to talk about, you know, truly the beginnings of what we call modern day roots rock and Americana. So I, I, I think... I think there's a pretty good reason why those albums are on that list, but I enjoy Excitable Boy more than both of those records, and Excitable Boy should be on that list. Yeah, I just I I don't know if you need John Wesley Harding and the Basement Tapes, like you know which one. You're I'm... also you're also a famous John Wesley Harding hater, yeah, only, I... only giving it a six out of ten. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean. I was just going to say, you know, which one of the two I would keep on the list if it was only one. Yeah. Anyway, um, the, I just thought that was an interesting point to bring up since Zevon is completely shunned from the list, which is crazy to me. Mm-hmm. But I don't know. No. I, I I don't put a lot of stock into it. I just think it's an interesting thing to refer back to throughout this series, um, which is another thing I do is look at the initial Rolling Stone review. And for anyone who's been watching this series regularly, you'll know that the Curtis episode... Um, Goodbye, Elbrick Road. There are a few of these like really well-regarded albums. Pounds of Love has had a really, really negative review um, mm. from Rolling Stone. And the Hunky Dory episode kind of broke that trend. And this episode will continue to break that trend because the review was overwhelmingly favorable in 1978. Um, sort of referring to Jackson Brown, Bruce Springsteen, and Warren Zevon as this sort of new generation of, of songwriters and yeah, and that all three of them would be doing more exciting stuff in the future, which, you know, it's pretty cool. Um, so just shout out Rolling Stone for not fucking it up this time. Um, <laughs> I, have, I have had to bring out Chris Gow's review, though, because uh, I think this is kind of hilarious. Um, the further these songs get from Ronstadt land, the more I like them. No one has yet <laughs> been able to explain to me what accidentally like a martyr might mean. Answers dependent on the term Dylan-esque are not acceptable. And I have no doubt that that's the image Linda will hone in on. After all, is she going to cover this one about the headless gunner? <laughs> that's funny, well, but I, I don't know. It's, I mean, I get that accidentally like a martyr isn't the most uh, common phrase, but I feel like if you think about it for yeah. more than two minutes, you can yeah. surmise what it means. It, <laughs> I didn't include the review because I agreed with it. I included it because it was funny. So <laughs> Sure. <laughs> um and that leads us, of course, into our track ratings, the moment you've all been waiting for. Um, I'm going to go first with side one, and Dylan's going to do his side one ratings, and then we'll do side two. So, Johnny Strikes at the Band, we talked about already. For me, it's a nine out of ten. Excellent opener to the album. Track two, Roland, the Headless Thompson Gunner, I have as an eight out of ten. I think it's very good. <laughs> Um, it slows things down in the track two spot, which I don't think is necessarily a bad thing. Um, I I don't know about the way the backing vocals come in for the second chorus. Like we've talked about how, you know, every moment on the album is so deliberate and everything comes in at the right time. And that is one moment where I'm like, ah, this sounds a bit sort of stuffy. Um, this, that is a nitpick. Uh, I... It's a contributor to the album's trend of having morbid topics take up songs, which I think is really cool. And I think lyrically, it's awesome. I just think musically, it's a bit... I think it suffers from being on side one, basically, because all the other songs on side one are my beloved. And this song is just very good. I enjoy it for me, personally. Um, Track three is the title track. This is my favourite song on the album. Ten out of ten. I talked about the opening piano part of Werewolves of London being crazy catchy. This is like a whole other level. As soon as it's do-do-do-do, I'm like, yeah, I'm in. Like, it's so good. Hooks me in immediately. Lyrically, oh my God, it is a masterpiece. It is morbid and funny and like the best Zevon songs, it is exaggerated but accurate to the world, you know, Um, and how people brush off others' actions is like, you know, the whole refrain, he's an excitable boy, they all said, like, it's not that dissimilar from things we've heard about, you know, men doing awful shit. Um, of course, they didn't, you know, make a play with someone's bones um, or whatever. But uh, it's like this this exaggerated idea of, of a real world concept. And uh, 
yeah so it's it's like so funny how it takes that dark turn midway through the song which the first time you hear it is like the most hilarious thing ever but yeah it's it's this song more than any i think epitomizes zevon's ability like you said to make you laugh and not cry but make you think you know of like mm, yeah mm, not nice um my number yeah track four is wales of london of course 10 out of 10 come on come on uh and then accidentally like a martyr is a another nine i think it is fantastic uh as well yeah nine means i hate it i know yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and as we've discussed multiple times before, when someone doesn't have the exact same opinion as you, um, it's completely personal. Um, yeah, and they are. So, evil. yes. Um, so, so let me tell you why you're wrong. Uh, because I, I have Johnny Strikes Up the Band at at a ten out of ten. I, you know, it's it's not my favorite song in the record, but. I, I struggle to think of anything that I don't absolutely love about it. I, I love the way, like I said, it drives everything forward. I love the composition of it. I love the individual performances on it. It gets me going. Um, I, I think it's a perfect album opener and, a, and just a perfect little song. Uh, and another perfect 10 out of 10 song is rolling the headless Thompson gunner. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I respect, I, I don't, necessarily agree I, i've never had any issues with the background vocals or or anything like that but i i respect if you feel that way i do love a lot of what's happening instrumentally on this song i love the way that the bass kind of mirrors that piano intro or like walks along with it um excellent bass work really all over this record but um i mean just for this one song to to cover so many different topics, you know, talking about, you know, the Congo crisis and then, you know, making references near the end of the song to, you know, what was happening in Palestine, Israel, you know, Ireland, Lebanon, and, and, and to include the, the Patty Hearst story as well, like at the very end, what an insane, you know, surreal, uh, you know, th this whole, crazy story about you know a man who gets his head blown off and continues to to haunt all of these different crises and then it ends with patty hurst heard the burst of roland's thompson gun and bought it and that's the end of the song i, I absolutely brilliant for me it's a 10 out of 10 um man you absolutely nailed it with excitable boy <laughs> three three straight tens to start off the record for me and yeah, I mean, I really think it is way ahead of its time. You know, uh, you think about so many things that have happened around the world. Yeah, I, I hate to distill so much of it down to America um, because you know there are you know so so many issues with mental health and and other crises throughout the world but you know me being an american and everything being so magnified here it makes me think about all of the different you know school shootings and 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 other um catastrophes and, and disasters that have happened and you know they all they always end the same way you know people claiming ignorance or feigning ignorance like we don't know how how this could have happened you know he was such a nice kid we thought he was just an excitable boy. You know, it, it, when there are so many warning signs, you talk about it, it it starts off so harmlessly, you know, he's just rubbing a pot roast all over his chest, you know, isn't that cute? And then, well, now he's biting a usherette's leg in the dark at a movie theater. Like, oh, that's, that's kind of weird and problematic, but certainly there couldn't be anything. And then he took little Susie to the junior prom and then he raped her and killed her and took her home and then went to jail and got out and built a cage with her butt. And all while this is happening, you've got, Ooh, excitable boy. And you've got a, a nice jaunty little Benny Hill back. So, you know, sax solo, bam, 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 bam. an amazing juxtaposition. I mean, People who always claim, like, we don't know how this could have happened. It's like, well, Warren got it, you know, over 40 years ago. How are you not getting it now? Uh, just an insane, you know, and, and it's uncomfortable. I mean, it, you know, when you read the lyrics, it's a very uncomfortable song. Um, 
but it's also darkly hysterical when you hear the musical and lyrical juxtaposition together. Uh, the more I talk about it, the more I'm like, maybe this is also my favorite song on the record. Uh, I, I certainly think it's one of the most brilliant songs ever written. Um, and, and Werewolves of London, I'm, I'm giving Werewolves a nine out of 10, you know, maybe just for just for the exhaustion factor. I've heard it so many times, but I don't, I don't love it any less. Um, but it's, it is fantastic. And, and then we close out with, for me, an, another 10. I'm, I'm very easy to please with side A of this record. I, I think Accidentally Like a Martyr is everything I want out of a Warren Zevon heartbreak number. Again, musically, lyrically, melodically. Um, it's perfect. Perfect song. It's one of the great side A's. So I, I don't yeah. like, like all these songs are fantastic. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. And on Excitable Boy as well, I think like, you touched on a lot of it, but I think the melody is, I don't want to say it's like nursery rhyme-esque, but it's like, mm -hmm. it's its almost that sort of like bouncy sort of like childlike sort of, you could change the lyrics and make it a kid's song, basically. Is this what I love about it? it, it, it it's, yeah, every it's very major key. It, it falls along, it flows so nicely. And I also, I mean, it is fantastic too. Uh, you know, the, the one end of it, well, he's just an excitable boy, you know, like when he kind of like breaks that and like really taps into the character. Uh, yeah, just the man was a genius. He was absolutely perfect. Ugh. Yeah. Yeah. So side two, kicking off with nighttime in the switching yard. Um, poor, poor nighttime in the switching yard. Never truly given any love. Um, and you know, it is one of the weaker songs on the album, but I think it serves an important purpose in terms of variety. And I think it's great to hear Zevon's take on something so different to the rest of the album. And I do think the groove is is so good. Like Jeff Picaro, he's pretty good at playing drums, surprisingly. Um uh <laughs> and it is like to come after the melancholic and soul crushing accidentally like Amar, it's pretty much the perfect place to put it. So I've got an eight out of 10 because it is a bit cheesy, but it's melodic and it's got a good groove and it's fun. So there. Um, after that, you got Vera Cruz, which is probably my least favorite song on the album. Um, I have that also as an eight though. So I don't think this album gets below like really good slash great. Like all the songs are just <laughs> like really solid. Um, it's a solid ballad. Um, I actually really like the section in Spanish with the harp, um, mm -hmm. which is really pretty. And again, adds a bit of variety and it's very unexpected. There's so many unexpected moments in the songwriting and in the structure of these songs. Um, you know, like we were talking about with In the Middle of Excitable Boy when it just takes that turn. Um, but yeah, that's really good song. Um, not one I really go back to, but it works well in album context. Track three on side two is actually the one I've been loving the most this week, uh, Tenderness on the Block, which, you know, the ones I went back to were basically the singles and Accidentally Like a Martyr. Those are like my my rotation for this album. And this this song is fantastic. The the piano chords, um, is it like a, I don't know what the instrument is, is it like a electric piano or something? I don't know, you'll tell me in a minute. The do -do 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 -do. Anyway, really good memory. Memory? Melody. God. Uh, <laughs> one of my favorite arrangements on the album. Um, whatever that keyboard is, sounds great. Um, the chorus is fantastic. Uh, is this the one that's co-written by Jackson Brown? I think it is. Um, and uh, I believe so. Yeah, the vocal performance is just, it's just killer. It's, uh, yeah, there's not much to say about a lot of these songs. They're just like really well written, really solid, like piano led songs. And then of course, Closing the album on Lawyers, Guns and Money, which is, of course, a 10 out of 10. If I met anybody who said this wasn't a 10 out of 10 song, I would not trust them. Um, but we didn't really talk about how it works as a closing track. And I think I've sort of talked at length that, like, there's two main types of good closing tracks to me. There's, like, the big, epic, emotional closing track that sort of puts a cap on the album. We're thinking, like, the Abbey Road medley, we're thinking, you know, those kinds of closers. And then you have the kind of closer that is so catchy and infectious and such a banger that it makes you want to put the album on again. 
<laughs> that's that's the kind of closer that lawyers guns and money is because sure it's not like this great thematic statement to close the album but it is such a great like you said just just head banging along it is just so infectious and every time i hear it the temptation is there to just oh let's just start again um you know i, I think homegrown by neil young from american stars and bars my beloved um is also like that where you're just like singing there along with that and then you're like oh man i'm gonna play the album again um and yeah i think it's it, that's a really underrated type of closer because i think people put more stock in well jungle land for one as well is another one of these like big epic sweeping closes but i think closing on just a banger pop track can't hardly wait by the replacements man that's another one so there's loads of them but lawyers guns and money is one of the best um and that is yeah. why it's a 10 out of 10 not just because it's a great song in its own right but as a closing track it is genius yeah i, I completely agree and is it i i think and I'll look it up to make sure I don't mess this up, but I feel like the album before ends on Desperados Under the Eaves. Yeah. Yep, it yeah. does, which, which is kind of the opposite of what you're talking about. Um, yeah, yeah, and again, it works perfectly. It's a brilliant song, but um, yeah, you. T- I was going to say to you, take the words right out of my mouth, A not, not just a, a perfect closer in the sense that like when you get to the end of the album, it's exactly what you want to hear, but I was going to say the same exact thing. It always makes me want to start it over. Uh, which also it doesn't hurt knowing that when you go back to it, you're going to be greeted with the perfect album opener. Um, so yeah, it's it's perfectly sequenced, and and I actually think that nighttime in the switching yard, in, in some ways, is um, a great side two opener. Yeah, I I could have seen side two opening with a ballad, maybe even opening the side with accidentally like a martyr, or to your point, maybe something like Roland. Um, but I think, you know, flipping over the record and, and being met with this kind of, you know, different sound, different groove is, is nice. Um, you know, I've, I've said before that, um, you know, I love this album so much despite nighttime and the switching yard, which, which isn't fair necessarily because there's aspects of it. I do like, I, I think the background vocal arrangement on it is really cool in particular, um, but you know, there, there's just not much to it from a, um, from a compositional standpoint. And then, um, you know, it, the style is, it's just not very Dylan core. Um, you know, this, this sort of funky disco thing with, with not a lot else to it. I like it enough to give it a six out of 10. You know, I, I don't despise it by any means, but it's, it's the last one you know that i reach for i i don't reach for it i listen to it when i'm listening to the album and that's really it um and then veracruz i i've also gotten an, an an eight out of ten um but i i do think like you said it's wonderful um i think uh god the these opening uh, or not the opening lyrics more in the second voice like i swear it was my father's voice saying if you stay, you'll all be slain. You must leave now. You have no choice. Take the servants and ride west. Keep the child close to your chest. When the American troops withdraw, let Zapata take the rest. I mean, like, it's it, his way of, of telling these stories. Again, it's so straightforward, but it is so emotional. Um, yeah, it's, it's not my favorite song on the album, but I do think it, it moves forward really nicely. It's a nice ballad. Um, I... I'm with the untenderness on the block too. Uh, this this is one that's really grown in estimation for me throughout the years. I've got it at a nine out of ten right now, and I could be wrong. I I think it's just an acoustic piano doing the da 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 with the guitars kind of then doing the da 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 afterwards, creating this really nice, like I said, this sort of coexistence call and response sort of thing. Um, really beautiful melody on this one. Another great vocal performance this one and accidentally like a martyr the two songs that are just you know straight up personal relational songs and i think you really hear it he he puts his his whole heart into these vocals um another great uh background vocal arrangement on this one um and i think a, a good penultimate song leading into the undeniable 10 out of 10 lawyers guns and money which I think we we've said all that can be said about it. It's it's a perfect song, perfect album closer. Yeah, I've 
I've got five 10 out of 10s on this album. I, I just think it's absolutely, absolutely great. Yeah, yeah, totally fair. I have three, but I maybe with time, tenderness gets up there and Johnny Strikes Up the Band gets up there. I don't know. Yeah. So many great songs. And that leads us, finally, I did sort of hint that we may be going over an hour. I don't know how long exactly, but I think it's around that mark. Um, but that's fine. Sometimes you do get these long episodes of this series and people will know that when an episode of Anatomy of a Classic comes out, it's either going to be 30 minutes or an hour. There's no in-between. Um, of course, I'm a big fan of this album. Why else would I want to do an episode on it? I think it's among the pinnacle of 70s singer-songwriter. And yeah, like I said, I get a lot of different styles in this album. I do stand by. There's a bit of sort of Americana influence in the songwriting. There's a bit of pub rock influence, I think, in some in some places. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, like you said, Zevon is sort of doing this sort of pop rock first and foremost sound, which is really good. So you have this pristine production without sacrificing any grit, which is basically, I know we agree on that. We don't want our production yeah. too smooth because um, it's it is it sounds fantastic, but it also has that bite to it, which I think is really important. Zevon himself is an irresistible personality contributing some of his most iconic and lasting songs as well as some real underrated gems that you will discover if you've never heard the album before so i'm going nine out of ten it's a strong nine um i think it's really well sequenced it's short and sweet it's hard to go wrong it's easy to love it's excitable boy very very well said i i completely agree with you on on the sound of the record um you know, I I struggle to think of the right word for it because I always say, you know, I want my music to have a little grit, but but I don't necessarily mean that I I need it to be like loud or um or I, or I I don't need it to you know have some necessarily super raw quality to it, but you know, for me, music is such a personal thing, so there needs to be a, a big sense of humanity to it for me, or even a song like, you know, don't think twice. It's all right by Dylan. You know, there's no grit to that. You know, it's a very pretty guitar part, a very pretty melody. And, you know, even, even if you're someone who doesn't love Dylan's voice necessarily, like I think his voice sounds very clear and smooth on a song like that, but it's got such like, in my mind, it's the grit, the human aspect where, you know, you, you hear the lyrics and it just friggin' cuts to you. When something is so shiny and clean just across the board, it's often so hard for me to relate to it. This record, everything, it sounds clean, quote unquote, in the sense that like the drums are very clear, the bass is very clear, even when the guitars are distorted, they, they're very clear. Everything is very dry and upfront. Um, but I think thanks to the character and the personality in his vocal, as well as his songwriting, there is enough of that, yeah, that, that sort of dirtiness, that humanity to it that I really need. And just when I think about, you know, what I look for most in music and, you know, I look for different things out of different artists and different genres, but generally I want strong melodies, check, you know, for singer songwriter lyric or for singer songwriter record, great lyrics, check. Um, interesting arrangement, interesting arrangements, check. Everything I could want is here. Um, this is a 10 out of 10 for me. Um, e- even with, you know, the songs that I don't love as much, um, just as an experience, you know, I, I never listen to this record and necessarily think, God, I wish that Nighttime in the Switching Yard wasn't on here, you know, even though I don't absolutely love it. I've I've grown to accept it and like it as a part of the experience, as has Fiona, which is why she wanted to be here for when I made this point. Um, and it, it's not only are so many of the individual parts so excellent, they really create what I think is a, a great cohesive whole. I, I love sequencing uh i love the sound i love everything about it it's uh it's most certainly a a top 50 album of all time for me yeah 
Yeah. Well, I was waiting for Fiona's appearance and it comes right at the death. Never disappoint. She always she always finds a way. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Dylan, for joining me. It's been it's been a blast. It's been it's been something all right. I hope people got something out of our discussion. If you've not heard Excitable Boy, I hope this has made you want to listen to it. Um, and fair play for making it through an hour plus discussion of an album you've never heard. Um, if you have heard the album, we'd love to know what your favorite songs on the album are, um, what you think of it overall, what you think of Warren Zevon overall. Is it your favorite Warren Zevon album? Um, it's definitely mine. And uh, go listen to The Minx and watch my other videos <laughs> that's basically all you need to do so from me and dylan thank you very much for watching and hopefully we'll catch you soon